see that we have both our speakers on the line. Thank you so much to Steve Varley, uh, who is the Global Vice Chair of Sustainability of EY, leading uh, the climate change and sustainability agenda globally for the organization. And it was actually the first role of its kind in the big four. Uh, Steve is involved in a number of incredible initiatives, uh, working with a number of chief sustainability officers in the procurement space, um, and also collaborating with uh, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales on a number of things. So thank you so much for joining us. I, and I am equally pleased to have uh, Professor Kevin Lyons here with us today. Kevin is both a professor and a practitioner with a really deep knowledge of procurement, supply chain, sustainability, um, and he's working on a number of initiatives that really link sustainability to social justice. So thank you both for joining us here today. I will hand it over to you both. Thank you, Noah. I really appreciate that uh, introduction. And Steve, it's great to have you here. Uh, we have a very important topic today. We've heard from the university president and others uh, on this uh, uh, great event today, but today we reserve the best for the 12 o'clock Eastern time uh, session. And that's you and, and what you've been doing at EY. So we really appreciate you and your time. So I'm gonna get right to it. Um, we share a lot of, of similar uh, work and, and research. And one thing I want to say right up front before I start asking you a little uh, bit of questions on what you've done is I just submitted a report to the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. We did a, a disparity study on the equity world. So it was one of the first of its kind here in Jersey. And so a lot of what you're going to be talking about and the work that you've done, not only is, you know, equitable in sustainability, and how we look at institutions and finance, but also looking deeper in, in taking a deep dive in the data about who uh, gets equitable uh, distribution of, of funds and wealth as well. So let's get into this topic of understanding the green power gap with you. And so I wanna start with last year, uh, EY produced a report on the global green transition and an apparent gap has been emerging between all of our nations. Uh, so can you, uh, let us know a little bit or tell us why uh, EY chose uh, this particular topic. Well, let me start off by saying, Professor Lyons, Kevin, great to be at this Rutgers event with you and the rest of the team. I'm huge fans of your work and I'll look forward to reading what you've just submitted uh, on equity, a really important topic, not just on the northeast of the US and across the US, but around the world. So I really look forward to, uh, to reading that. And thanks to Rutgers for providing an opportunity to talk about this fantastic report that we completed last year, which, as you kind of summed up, is about the green power gap. Uh, and let me give you some context and then maybe, Kevin, we can kick around uh, the, the complications that led us to do this report and then also the recommendations because there's a lot going on. And for those of you that haven't managed to see it yet, you can pick this up from our EY website. If you Google away, I'm sure you can find it. Um, but it's really fascinating. Uh, and if you remember this time last year, I think we're all talking about COP26, November, Glasgow, and a huge interest in the major emitters by countries. Now, let's get into some of the language of a COP here. Uh, as the countries come together, the Confederation of Parties, the parties come together, 192 countries look to come to Glasgow to talk about their NDCs, nationally determined contributions, which basically is a UN term where under the Paris Agreement, each party, each country was compelled to, five years after Paris, submit to the COP, COP26 in Glasgow, their new NDC, which is basically their plan to reduce greenhouse gases, plural. Uh, and we tend to talk about CO2 as a catch-all for the seven greenhouse gases that we recognize. So this time last year, big debate on NDCs, country by country, uh, the quality press, the financial press, and the press that covers this topic was full of the countries that had submitted are not set about putting in place bigger targets. 
and also those that hadn't submitted as well, Kevin. Uh, and uh, maybe something that didn't pick up new, new much press that may be of interest to all of the listeners here is that as we rolled into COP on the first day the COP started, still 44 countries had not submitted a new NDC, which is just amazing that the UN compelled the countries to submit a new greenhouse gas reduction, but over 40 had not. So what did we look to do in, in this report? Well, what we're looking at is really the countries that were, that were emitting, and we're trying to work out who had the innovation and the technology to solve this climate change problem. And we watched with real interest how the developed world, if I go to COVID-19, how creative vaccines and then distributing vaccines pretty well to those countries that didn't have their own pharmaceutical base and therefore their own vaccines. And the sort of question we were getting into, Kevin, is could a similar thing happen to solve the climate emergencies. Our view, when we looked at the world at a macro level, there's enough money out there, financing, and enough solutions to solve climate change. However, they're just disconnected and unevenly distributed. So we thought we'd look at, at a country level, where's the innovation, where's the financing, who is leading on solving climate, and then ask ourselves a question, how can we better equitably distribute the financing and the innovation so that together the world solves the climate change problem and we don't leave anybody behind? Especially my last bit in the, uh, the answer to your question here, Kevin, especially the LDCs, so the less developed countries, uh, an official UN term. Uh, and one of my most humbling moments as I spent two weeks in Glasgow in the blue zone, in the heart of the negotiations, was talking to indigenous tribes and peoples from small islands, low-line islands, and to hear them talk about the challenges they have today because of climate change and what they need to solve those problems today as their livelihoods and their families and their heritage is being disrupted. So Kevin, this was a hopeful piece of work. We hope to find a way of better distributing the financing and the innovation so the world can move forward as one. That was the idea behind the report. It was a brilliant report. I mean, it was concise. It hit all the uh, touch points. As you mentioned, the gap is so wide that you can you know, drive anything through it. However, I like the way that you were able to then uh, start to look at some of those uh, potential solutions and what we can do. We have the capacity, as you said, to do something. And it takes a collective group of all of us to, to do, actually make that happen. So pivoting to COP26, I understand that obviously you were there and high expectations, um, but I'm curious to find out what were the main findings? I mean, you wrote a report about your experience uh, there. And so what came about? What, I mean, did we hit all those targets that we wanted to hit and everybody eventually participated and everything is, is, is where we want it to be or what happened? No, I think there's uh, quite a lot being written on whether COP26 was a success. So let me talk briefly about that. Then let me come back to this report, because I think the report is also now going to have an impact on COP27 as we look towards November this year and the COP being hosted by Egypt in Sharm El Sheikh and our expectations and how we can together influence COP27. On this agenda, Kevin, the report talks about of closing the green power gap. So there was kind of unusual, I think, that the world's two largest emitters, China and the USA, were also found by this report to have leadership in nearly every factor of what we framed as the green power gap. So both China and the US, who still burn a lot of fossil fuels in transportation and energy, were also found to be leaders Somewhat bizarre, but let me unpack that some more for everybody, Kevin. Okay. So the five key factors that we found that identified how leadership came about for both China and the USA. The first one was the amount of academic research. I could say the amount of brains considering climate change as a problem. 
uh, on academic research, to give you all a bit of data, China published 75,000 academic documents on renewables, climate change in the broad in 2020. That's twice as much as the USA. But China and the USA together published five times more than everybody else added together. So the first factor on what creates power and green power was brains, academic research. The second, venture capital, money. Over half the money deployed to venture capital startups in this agenda went to USA startups, then the EU. China was a little further down, but now we're starting to build up a picture of what creates power, brains, money. And I must say for the USA, the phenomenon of Silicon Valley, that melting pot of academia, money, has created a culture that we could do with across many countries as we seek to solve the climate crisis. The third factor was assets. Uh, and let's take one part of that, electric vehicle manufacturing. Did we realize that 50% of the world's capacity for electric vehicles is in China? And actually China and the USA on dollar terms is tied on the investment into batteries and EVs. So the third factor was assets, manufacturing capability. The fourth was patents, ideas that make a difference. China has more patents on renewables, batteries, solutions on climate change than all the rest of the world combined. Amazing. And the last bit was target setting. China has the biggest goals as a country for renewables rollout. By 2030, 40% of the total Chinese power market will come from renewables. That, everybody, is a huge number. So you've got these five key factors that we found that if maximized in a country would create green leadership. And we found those to be the highest in both the China and the USA. They were green leaders by a long way, closely followed by France, Germany, UK and India. But when I say closely, Kevin, there's still a big gap. Two leaders, a gap and then four. Now, the question we then ask ourselves is, how do you replicate those five factors in other countries, and especially those countries that are LDCs, less developed countries? How do you do that so that we can all move forward together on this climate change solution? That's incredible. I mean, I think the you know collaborative, which we'll talk about a little bit later, where we have the capacity, but how do you then share that and partner with and make sure that there's equal distribution among not only the, the patents and the knowledge, but how does that then turn into action that happens on the ground, which I think is really critically important. So I wanna speak about um, energy. Energy seems to be the, the topic that uh, creeps into to all of these reports. It sits right there on the top. It's something that everyone recognizes, but I mean, it's a massive part of the transition, but obviously it's not the only uh, part or piece of the infrastructure that needs to be uh, evolving. So when you look at the wider uh, ecosystem and how, you know, we always talk about the nexus, the nexus between, you know, this and that, and we are now, you know, transitioning from, you know, traditional energy to renewables. When we look at the bigger uh, ecosystem, uh, what else is in there? What can we discuss that's also inside that, that green transition? You know, we want to transition from energy, but I'm sure there's a lot of other topics that need to be addressed as well at the same time. Oh, yes, this is a, a problem with multiple complications. But let's stick with energy for the moment. And I don't think we can talk about energy, especially where I am in Europe and actually where you are in the U.S., without recognizing the impact of the tragedy from the atrocities of Russia's invasion of Ukraine yes. and how that's making Northern Europe especially think through how to de-Putinize its energy system. Now, I think in a short term, we could expect as Europe looks for different energy sources outside of Russian gas, there will be a continued dash for gas, but from different providers, including the US and the shipping of massive container ships of LNG from the US into Europe 
so that we can get off Russian gas. Now, that will be the short term, I'm sure. What we need to do in Europe is make sure that our next step after the gas for, dash for gas security is to make sure that we really accelerate renewables. And what we don't do is carry on getting fossil fuels, but just getting from a different provider. And there's a lot going on, Kevin, to be positive about in the EU. So, for example, uh, the EU has got this significant fund of money in the EU Green Deal. And I know that consortiums will be announced very soon of major utility firms plus major technology firms that will pull down billions of dollars from that EU Green Fund to accelerate green hydrogen. And there's a deal that was announced just a few days ago between uh, some European companies and Australian companies to import significant power of green hydrogen from Australia into the EU. So I think the main message at the moment, Kevin, is that we all need to make sure, especially in Europe, that there isn't a short-term gas dash for gas that becomes a medium and long-term solution. We have to use this opportunity to go deeper into renewables, solar, wind, and also alternative energies, green hydrogen, so hydrogen created by renewables, but also pink hydrogen, hydrogen created by using nuclear energy as well. But as you said, um, there's several parts to this. So what else do we have as major emitters? Transportation, we know, uh, but also the food production to be considered. Uh, it's well documented the methane gas emissions from cows, but more than that as well, in that there's a massive amount of deforestation still happening globally to make space for cattle ranching, which has got two significant negative effects. And then let me be home to maybe my household, your household, in the consumer goods we buy. Do we really take advantage of the circular economy? Do we really prioritize buying consumer goods that are made in a renewable, maximized way? And what consumer products companies talk about everybody is the intent gap. So when you and I are asked in the street by a pollster, if we'd spend extra money to buy a green product versus maybe a higher polluting product, a product that's been made out of recycled plastic rather than virgin plastic, would we pay another 10%? Apparently, many people tick the box and says yes. But consumer products companies are finding there's an intent gap. Because by the time we've been through the supermarket, by the time we've been through the shopping mall, and we make our way to the checkout, we find ourselves holding the same brand we've always bought. We had good intent, Kevin, but we haven't actually delivered on it. So I think there's a lot more to do on consumer behaviors. And, and I haven't even touched on infrastructure challenges, cement production, steel production, which of course are also major emitters. And, for anybody who's not read Bill Gates' book on this whole area, you should do. It's a really good read, really simply put forward in a very compelling way, Kevin. This is amazing. I mean, I think that, you know, this brings up, you know, supply chains need to evolve as well because uh, supply chains, as well as how we market, you know, these products to the consumers, as you said, there's that brand loyalty that keeps folks, uh, Somewhat, somewhat compelled to do the same thing that they've done before because we we hear and we see uh, the marketing that goes behind it. So it's almost as though they, I want to do the right thing, but you know I'm really getting this pressure uh, to do something else. But I think it has to be a collective, all-in strategy, which is the supply chain delivering these concepts. And as you mentioned, even with concrete, um, you know now there's a, a, a sand shortage you know, uh, globally, which is now starting to be something I'm investigating and looking into. So as we keep mm -hmm. pushing for uh, these, uh, you know, keep the business as usual, we're, obviously we're gonna have to, uh, you know, think about the fact that we're running out of resources as well. Yeah, so, uh, maybe, maybe just let me throw one more idea in for everybody. And this is how roles are changing within big organizations. So for a long time, actually created by a wave of business change in the US many decades ago, the rise of the chief marketing officers. And their job was to get product and services in front of you and I, present them in a particular way that created a need. So we needed to buy those new sneakers or 
a new automobile or have the holiday. Now I'm hearing in some quite senior circles how those roles should change to support, support what we need in terms of planetary boundaries. So CMOs, Chief Marketing Officers, should be rethinking whether what they've been selling to us is actually still really needed today. And maybe the role of a CMO should be to point out to us whether we do need those new sneakers or that new car or have that holiday in the flight. So what I'm talking about really is moving away from unending consumerism to buying within planetary boundaries. That's a really big shift, Kevin. I think it's a fascinating area to get into because that's not how we've run now decades of capitalism. When Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, said in his New York Times article in the early 1970s, the business of business is business, by which he meant maximizing profits. I think today you and I and many others would disagree with that. We would say the business of business is bigger than business. And what I mean by that, everybody, is that businesses have to think about externalities. You can't just go on doing what you did yesterday. Now you've got to think about the impact on the planet, the externality. And I think that's a huge change driver, Kevin. Absolutely. And that brings me to, you know, inevitably, you know, business and finance, in, you know, can and should play a role, uh, a very important role. Uh, in correcting these imbalances. And so um, what are your thoughts about that? Hmm. Well, let's talk about some positives. Okay. It's great to see the massive wall of money moving into green financing, sustainable financing, the massive wall of money that we are all putting through our pension funds, through asset managers into so-called ESG investing. I think there's an even bigger opportunity to marry together the projects that need the financing with the cash. Uh, and for those of you that don't track this, it's actually quite hard to find investable projects. But let's talk about COP27 for this. The objectives for COP27, the formal objectives, haven't yet been announced, Kevin. But let's look back at COP26. COP26 had four objectives. The first one was about recognizing the impact of mitigation. It's let's start the planet warming up by more than one and a half degrees. The second objective was on adaptation. How do we help people adapt to climate change that's impacting them today? The third objective was the point you just made, Kevin, on financing. How do we free up the financing so it flows to those projects that need it, especially projects that mitigate or create adaptation? And the last of the objectives in Glasgow was let's all work together. Now, I think most of us would say that objective number two and number three from Glasgow should be rolled directly into Egypt and COP27, because we need to help the people I mentioned earlier on, those in less developed countries and their adaptation needs. You know, in this global south, the global south, is where you can see more of the impacts of climate change than where we are, Kevin, in the global north, to use the UN terms. Mm -hmm. So financing, there's a significant amount of financing being promised. But for some reason, everybody, I still think there's a breakdown between the wall of money getting to the projects and people that need it. And I'd love, Kevin, to see COP27 really focus on connecting the money to the projects, especially for those peoples that are already being impacted by climate change. Yeah, that's critically important. It seems like you said the, 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 there's the assembly of folks, there's the promises, there's the, you know, the money is there. I mean, the, the countries that promise can actually do it. It's that gap between saying that you're gonna do it and then getting it directly into the hands of those who uh, need to, use it for those transitions that we're talking about right now. So I think that's that's really important. So hopefully, uh, uh, will you be at uh, COP27, I'm sure? <laughs> yes, yes. You know. Yeah, we as EY had a big delegation at COP26 and played a major role in the Blue Zone, helping parties with their negotiations. We'll be there for COP27. 
but but I feel a need just to add a little bit more into this COP dynamic, Kevin. So many will remember uh, the famous Paris COP, the Paris Agreement. Enshrined in the Paris Agreement were two articles. One of them talked about how those that had technology and innovation would create a fund to provide it to those that didn't. And the second was the same on money. The financing, those that had the financing would provide the financing to those that didn't have it. There's a very simplistic view of two complicated pieces of script from the UN articles. Now, if you're in the global South, if you're from a low-lying nation, indigenous peoples, you'd be pointing at that Paris Agreement and you'd be suggesting that those commitments have not been met by the UN. So that's, I think, part of the backdrop, everybody, for COP27. Promises were made in Paris. At Glasgow, there were demonstrations in the COP from people who thought those promises hadn't been kept. I would say the UN, the UNFCCC, can do a really good job now of doing an inventory. What money was promised and what flowed? What technology was promised? What are the examples where the technology was deployed to those that need it? I think we all need to hold ourselves to account. If that hasn't happened and we promised it, we definitely need to deliver a COP27 and beyond. Because that goes back to the heart of this green power paper, Kevin. The green power gap says there's enough out there to really slow down the warming of the planet, but it's mostly held by two countries and then another four. That's six countries, everybody. There's 192 countries attend the Confederation of Parties. Now you can do the math just as quickly as me. 186 countries therefore could do with what the six have. And I think that should be part of the heart of COP27, Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like you know, this understanding that if we don't get everyone to participate, it actually makes it harder uh, for the six, in a sense, to do what they need to do. It's almost as though that we have to understand that it's an all-in strategy it would ultimately help, you know, reduce cost as well, because the yeah. burdens that we're putting on others to actually continuously struggle, I believe, is also costing us, you know, quite a bit as well. Yeah. Um, it's a whole world. We all live in the same planet. It, you know, we have to think that it's all, we're all in it. Yeah. And let me just add in this point, Kevin, that you quite rightly have a track history of being a spokesperson about creating equity. You do a fantastic job. And I think I could frame some of the history of climate change on that basis. So if you talk to the LDCs, they would say the Western world, especially the global Northwest, again, to use the UN language, has profited from an industrial revolution that created great wealth for Europeans and North Americans in particular. But that industrial revolution polluted the planet. It set us on a course for greenhouse gas emissions, which has put the planet in peril. Now, if you're in a country that hasn't yet gone through that industrial revolution, the way you could hear the rhetoric from a cop is that we now, the global Northwest, think the planet is in peril and you should skip that wealth creation event. You should move straight to renewables. We're going to have to buy the renewables from those that have it. That comes to the two and the four. I don't think anybody could argue, Kevin, that's equitable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also part of the backdrop to what should be, needs to be, a really, really pivotal COP27, especially when the IPCC, uh, the institute that publishes the updates on climate, is being very clear that not only is the planet warming up, not only has, is that having a detrimental effect on humanity, but it's also wiping out wildlife, animals and plants. And then you start to get this second order effect on the impact on biodiversity, which is also going to have a, a huge impact on the collective planet that we all live on. Exactly. So just a couple more questions and then we'll see what the, uh, what the audience has to say. So um, when you think about the EY report and its entirety, was there something in there that really surprised you the most? I mean, was there something that's jumped literally off the page and, and, and hit you? Yeah, there was a, 
Uh, maybe we started this with the idea that if we could identify what created leaders, we could have a solution that said to everybody else, just replicate that, just replicate the five attributes I talked about that earlier on, Kevin. On reflection, we decided that couldn't be done. Nobody else but the US can have a Silicon Valley. Uh, nobody else but China and the US has the academic university strength or the patent creating machine. You can't do that if you're a smaller country. So then we talked to some other stakeholders in the ecosystem and we decided actually there's another path that we propose. Uh, in another path, we started to talk about how there needs to be new ways to collaborate. So let me put it this way. The power owners start to collaborate with those that don't have the power. And we see some of this in business where sometimes in business you get big companies teaming with startups because they both bring something to it. But we saw an opportunity for big companies, big countries to collaborate with the smaller countries. I think the EU Green Deal is a good example of that because not all countries in Europe have equal financial power. So that's good. Uh, and you may have seen going back to the crisis created by the Russian invasion into Ukraine, that the EU is now going to collaborate on something new, which is the bulk buying of power. They've never done that before. So we started looking different ways, Kevin, to, to spread the green power. And we talked about in the paper collaboration. Then we talked about policymakers having a new view of how they enable markets. And then lastly, we talked about how governments can incentivize and also to a degree penalize those that do the wrong thing uh, in the, on this agenda. And then Kevin, you get into quite difficult areas like carbon taxes, but also positives. Governments have the chance to create better green incentives as well. So what surprised me, Kevin, was um, our original thesis where we come up with ideas on how countries could all move forward. Uh, and actually what we found in the end was three different dynamics that we think countries can adopt and then move more quickly to become leaders. That, that was different. That's incredible. So you know, what's next? What's on the agenda? I mean, there's so much that you could be doing. I'm sure that uh, if you're like me, it's like, man, I, I, <laughs> I want to be everywhere. I have you know, so much work to do, but is there, uh, what's next for EY when you think about this entire package of all that you have done it's, it's just incredible but is there a next what is the next thing well in terms of the report i think we can do a refresh of the report uh, i think we can talk about more enablement how can countries execute on this uh, there's actually quite a lot of activity that we expect to continue through the rest of the calendar year where many governments are really interested in how they can move up the power, green power list that we've created on the back of this. So that's been really interesting for us. Uh, and obviously I've mentioned COP27 a few times. I hope that's on everybody's agenda and it doesn't have to be physically, you don't have to physically join uh, the event in Egypt. You can join virtually. And in fact, this very week, there's been a special Middle East regional version of a COP going on to talk about climate change which I hope many of the viewers have managed to get into. Uh, then from an EY perspective, uh, well, we made a bold, progressive ambition statement two years ago that we would remove and offset and really specifically reduce our emissions year on year on year to be carbon negative. <coughs> Something which we delivered in FY21, where we had a significant drop in our carbon dioxide emissions. And then where we still have an emissions footprint, we went to the open market and bought credits, removals and offsets to make us minus 35%, Kevin. Now, we're a simple business, 340,000 people. We don't make anything, we provide professional services. <coughs> it was easier for us to become carbon negative than for many. But because of the states of the planet, because we can, we decided to, we decided to go carbon negative. <coughs> so we've got more of that too, Kevin. Uh, <coughs> and then we're also continuing to invest 
in services in this area as well, because we have significant client demand. And we know that for many of our clients, especially the major emitters, the goods need help to deliver pathway reductions that stops the planet warming up. So we've got COP27, Kevin. We've got our own position to be carbon negative and net zero by 2025. Then we've got our big job of helping others. That's incredible. I mean, that's a, uh, that is definitely uh, enough work for a millennium, <laughs> for me at least, but it is good, solid work that needs to be done. I, I, I feel really happy that EY is, is all in, especially behind your leadership. This is really an exciting time. I mean, it's a perilous time with, you know, you know, obviously what's happening in Ukraine and, you know, uh, global warming and all the issues that we're talking about today. But it's also an opportunity for um, entrepreneurs and folks who want to concentrate on this very specific area. But for me specifically, I'm really interested in, in increasing the diversity of that entrepreneurship as well. You know, hearing from the indigenous uh, population who themselves have experienced a lot of the downfalls of what we're talking about, but should and could take leadership roles in uh, the creation of wealth and creation of ideas and innovations that contribute to the to the big picture as well. So I know that China and the US are dominating with the patents and the, and the research and such, but really it would be a nice groundswell to have uh, the rest of the, uh, the world also participate in contributing uh, solutions um, as well. So whatever we can do to make that happen uh, is something that I really like to, to be involved with as well. Um, so we're winding down on our time here and I'm looking at the, the chat here area to see if we have any questions. And so, you know, uh, I don't see any. So you've uh, obviously addressed everything that anyone ever wanted to hear about this particular topic. Um, there's a wealth of information on WISE website. I mean, the, the, the amount of reports that you have participated in um, is, is mind blowing. It's, uh, but critically important, you know, really good reads and the podcasts and everything else that I watched. I actually uh, had about 10,000 questions. I had to narrow it down to, <laughs> to just, a, just a handful today uh, because of all of what you guys are doing. Uh, is there anything uh, that you think, you know, I know that you're involved with the, the S30. This is the uh, chief sustainability officers all getting together. And I know that you co-chair that group. Is there anything you want to tell us about that in closing? Or is there any other big tidbit before we wrap it up? Well, let me just add in two more thoughts for everybody. Um, before I talk about the Sustainability 30, which is an initiative sponsored by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, underneath his vehicle, the Sustainable Markets Initiative. Before I talk about that group, uh, Kevin, there's been some huge news this last week or so on the climate reporting front. Uh, and just in our closing seconds, everybody, you should look at what the SEC is doing in the US, which has made a very bold move on compelling lots of companies to start to report out on their greenhouse gas emissions and also to comment on the impact on their financials when they file at the end of the year. That's a game changer, Kevin. Now, the report is out for comments, uh, comments in by the end of May, and there'll obviously be a process before that becomes law and becomes regulation and companies have to follow it. But it is really good to see the US vying for a leadership position on the reporting of climate risks, climate impact to financials, and also emissions. Because that domain typically, I think in the last few years, been dominated by the EU. And the EU have another paper that they're putting out on their CSRD, which does the same as the US, but maybe is amplified in a few areas. Uh, my home country, the UK, is there as well on reporting. And China's coming up strong as well, Kevin. So for those of you interested, you should look at what Mr. Gensler, as the head of the SEC, has put out. And then on the S30, look, you know, what we all need is to lean in here. Uh, we're looking to make big change happen. And the S30 is a group of chief sustainability officers from the leading companies of the world. Uh, and we come together not to talk about pledges and promises. I think a lot of people have done pledges and promises, Kevin. 
And I think there's a little bit of tiredness with that. We're talking about how do we make accelerated progress? What do we need to do to performance on real practical stuff? So that's been a form now that we've been running for over 18 months. It shows Kevin a lot of potential that these leading CSOs of huge companies can help influence CEOs, the business environment to stop the planet warming up, but also we're tackling other agendas like plastics and biodiversity. So I've got a lot of hope, Kevin, and maybe more of that from EY and others as we roll up to COP27. So Kevin, I hope I can see you in Egypt. I can hope I can see as many on this webinar in Egypt as well. It's going to be a very important meeting where all 192 parties come together in a conference to work out how we can slow down the warming of this beautiful planet to make sure it's good for us and our children and also animals and plants. Thanks very much, Kevin. Lovely to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And I know there were some late breaking questions, but I'll get to those separately, Noah, if that's okay. Um, we'll share them with Steve and we'll answer them personally. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And Noah, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you both. I thought this was a fascinating conversation. I appreciated both the breadth and the depth that we were able to get into. I, you know, and, and I'm glad that you were encouraging everyone on this call to, to participate in COP in some way. I think these global conversations really need to have more grassroots voices, and, and that's certainly much of what I've done in my career. And so I appreciate the, um, the call to action. Um, Kevin, I appreciate your time as well. I thought it was a very engaging conversation. And your last point on the SEC is it clearly touched a lot of nerves because there are many comments in the chat about this. And I think it's, you know, very timely and also appreciate that because it's a conversation we'll be continuing throughout the afternoon, uh, particularly in our next session with Tom Zaki, the founder and CEO of TerraCycle, and also with Andrew Winston, the co-author of Net Positive later this afternoon. And so... Again, I uh, really want to thank you both for your time. Kevin is in DC this week working with the government. Steve, it's five, it's almost 6 p.m. in the UK. So very much appreciate the effort. And just, you know, for those tuning in, we'll be joining the next session with Tom Zaki and our distinguished executive in residence, Aaron Byrne, uh, in about nine minutes. Thank you all. Bye, Steve. Bye, Alan. Thanks, Kevin. Good to see you again. Thanks, Noah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.